Gray retired. David Arthur Gray to make his presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My first duty is to welcome my colleague and friend, Ernest Elliott, into this National Assembly. I'm very happy to have him here. My only regret is, of course, the circumstances which led to his being uh, selected to enter the National Assembly this time. And I must add, uh, Mr. Speaker, that over the last few days, we have had to reflect on the political culture uh, in two particular events, one which led to the premature withdrawal of a promising young colleague, uh, Jaipal Sharma, just two years into his parliamentary career, a solid and valuable member of our team, which has been cut short. We also know, Mr. Speaker, that this month, April, is the 20th anniversary of the Rwanda genocide. And I would just like to caution, Mr. Speaker, on the injury that loose comments could make. Um, in the one instance, to the career of Jai Paul, and in another instance, Rwanda was no joke. Rwanda was a, a deadly serious genocidal conflict in which over 750,000 persons were killed. That is the population of Guyana. It is a crime against humanity. And we mustn't throw around these expressions, Mr. Speaker, as if they were just riots. I hope that the lessons learned from these two events would help to improve our political culture and that we should refrain from making remarks which are deliberately injurious, which are malicious, and which very frequently are also gratuitous and spurious. Mr. Speaker, I stood here on Tuesday the 17th of April 2012 to participate in the budget debate, the first budget debate for the 10th Parliament. I stood here again on Tuesday the 9th of April 2013 to participate in the debate on that year's budget. Today I stand here on Tuesday the 8th of April 2014 to participate in a debate in another budget. This year, as before, the budget was planned, prepared, and presented by the People's Progressive Party administration without meaningful consultation and collaboration yeah. with the majority in this assembly. Yeah. What we have today is a document which will provide a bitter Guyana for many Guyanese. The attention of this nation is focused on this budget. And we have a collective responsibility to ensure that the debates are serious and that the results of our discussions would result, would provide the Guyanese people with a good life. But what we have is the same old PPP, the same old evasions. The National Assembly meets today, Mr. Speaker, to deliberate on a budget. The Minister of Finance, who has masterminded this document, has avoided to mention even once the word poverty. Remarkable, in 85 pages, you cannot mention poverty once. He does not mention the word unemployment, not once. He does not mention the word immigration when everybody knows that there's a massive brain drain. 
one must ask oneself, for which, for which country was this budget written? Budget 2014 is not a budget for the poor. It is not a budget for workers. It is not a budget for the young. It is not a budget for the old. It is, it is anti poor, anti people, anti progress. It is driven by politics, not by economics. The very presentation of this budget re-emphasizes the need to establish as early as possible a parliamentary office of the budget. We need to build a permanent institution right here. We need to ensure that all sides in the National Assembly could comprehensively sit down and propose national measures which are needed for national development. It is clear that the Minister of Finance must be given the information and insights which seem to be so desperately deficient up Main Street. No single person or party knows everything. A partnership for national unity is on the road. We are in the villages and among the people every week. We cover the broken and collapsing waterfront at Kumaka. We cover the sunken road in Barbina just before the Honorable Minister got there. We cover the collapsing bridge at Maruka. Yeah. <laughs> we visit the flood victims at Friendship and Hackney in the Pomeroon yeah. and the Anna Regina Market. Yeah. We inspect the rotten selling at Parika and Breeding Hoop. We meet the frequently robbed residents of La Parfait Harmony. We walk the ground in all boys and Sophia and we listen to the woes of the vendors in Lusignan and Monopo markets. We are in Perth, we are in Brothers, we are in Sisters, we are in Rose Hall, we are in Port Bernard, we are in Bartica, we are in Ramadan. We see the broken water reservoir at Paramakatoi. We are in Bamboo Creek. We are in Anai, Arnaputa, Surama, Sawariwau, Aichuni, Kukwani. Listen to us and let us tell you what's going on. APN News on the road. We explore the huge country beyond Main Street. That is why we have been the ones to call over the past 12 months for a national flood control plan to stop this annual cycle of flooding. People are fed up. We are the ones to call for a national infrastructure plan to design a reliable countrywide network of aerodromes, bridges, highways, and stellings. We are the ones to call for a national plan of action for hinterland development to integrate Western Guyana more closely with Eastern Guyana. We are the ones to call for a national youth policy year after year to allow the young people to participate more fully in the management of their communities. We are the ones who call for a national drug strategy master plan that expired five years ago so that our communities would be protected from drug traffickers. APN News on the road, listen to us. Yes. We don't know everything, but we know a lot. And we know there are problems. Yeah. That is the why, Mr. Speaker, we have called for a commission of inquiry right. into our primary school system. Yeah. We have called for a commission of inquiry into the public health system where young mothers have so frequently died. We have called for a criminal for a commission of inquiry into criminal violence. We are the ones who are calling for an investigation into the assassination of Saturday Osar. Yeah. We are the ones who are calling for an inquiry into trafficking in persons. We are the ones who are calling for an inquiry into the problems affecting the sugar industry. We want to save sugar, but we want to save sugar from mismanagement. Yeah. We are the 
ones who are calling for an inquiry into the national insurance scheme we want, because we want to save our pensioners and other persons who are beneficiaries of that scheme from mismanagement. We are the ones who are calling from the deaths from gastroenteritis in the Barima Waini. We are the ones who are calling for investigations into the maritime accidents which have claimed so many of our lives. We know which side of the house does not support in independent inquiries into lawlessness. We know which side has not learned from its mistakes. And we know which side of the house keeps on making the same old mistakes. Mr. Speaker, these are the microeconomic fun fundamentals by which people live every day. We are concerned about the people who have to stare into the face of the people who run our schools, our hospitals, our police stations, and the NIS, the unfriendly face of an uncaring state. Yes. Our people, the ordinary people, want a budget that goes to the heart of everyday issues, the issues that confront them. One that does the greatest good for the greatest number. We want a budget for the people who are struggling with stagnant wages, with rampant cost of living increases, with rising childcare costs. We want a budget that stimulates, not frustrates growth. The budget before this assembly, however, Mr. Speaker, has evinced no inspiration, no imagination, and no innovation. What is it? It's the same old PPP, the same old platitudes. The Minister of Finance lays on the platitudes with a the trowel. They're thick and heavy in this budget's so-called medium-term outlook. No one will challenge the vision of a Guyana which makes the leap from being a country of promise and potential to one in which that promise is fulfilled and the potential is realized. No one can deny that we all want a country as the budget speech states, and I quote, one in which the unique advantages of our geographical location and our historical and bilateral relations, the vastness of our natural resources and the richness of our human resources are all harnessed in service to the national good. One in which we are better connected infrastructurally with our neighbors to realize more fully the benefits of integration. One in which we are better connected across land, air, and river to make our markets more efficient and to improve the ease with which our people can travel domestically. One in which the domestic digital divide is eliminated, where access to the vast advantages of information and communications technology is universally enjoyed. One in which our domestic energy requirements are met entirely by renewable resources and where we become an exporter of clean energy. One in which there's abundant food and supply, far exceeding our domestic requirements, making a tangible contribution to regional and global food security. One in which we have access to social services of a suitably high quality and where our national health and education attainment indicators meet in international standards. Mr. Speaker, people promise in poetry, but they perform in prose. As the bride says, the wedding was poetry, but the marriage is prose. So it is good to have a good speech, but what does the budget provide? This budget is not the road to get us there. It is not the way ahead. This budget simply does not provide the resources to transform the beautiful rhetoric of the minister's budget speech into reality. What provisions and resources are there in the budget to build rail highways between Linden and Lethem, between Aichuni and Kokwani, between Bartik and Madia, between Anai and Aishalton? What resources are there to develop a comprehensive national infrastructure network? None. What resources are there to give our youth access to high quality education, even at primary and secondary levels? 
What resources are there to provide every young person with an opportunity to find rewarding and productive employment? What resources are there to provide our citizens, our qualified citizens, from migrating? What resources are there to allow elderly persons to retire in comfort? What resources are there to provide an end or to bring an end to the cronyism that is undermining the transparent award of contracts to bona fide business businessmen? What resources are there to make our hinterland safe from daily banditry, safe enough from piracy to attract investors who want to bring their business here? What resources are there to stop the contraband trade, which distorts our economy and which nearly obliterated Port Kaichuma last week when an illegal fuel boat exploded? Mr. Speaker, let me tell this, learn this house. The cabinet commissioned an inquiry in 2003, 11 years ago, to investigate the same fuel smuggling. The then head of state, I don't know if I can mention his name, um, announced at that time that the state in 2003 was losing $6 billion a year in unpaid duties on fuel alone. Yet, 11 years later, in broad daylight, we still have an explosive fuel smuggling situation. Uh, can the blind commissioner bring an end to the contraband? What we have, Mr. Speaker, the same old PBP, the same old indifference to contraband. The public security crisis will not correct itself. Narco trafficking is the engine of growth that is driving this country's high rates of money laundering, high rates of gun running, and execution murders, and armed robberies. Violent crime, not Kaicho news, not Sabric news, violent crime is what is staring, scaring foreign investors, driving away the educated elite, undermining economic growth, and impeding social development. The lucrative narco trade has spawned armed gangs, which use their wealth to purchase political influence and suborn the security forces in order to protect their interests. Money launderers associated with narco traffickers also dis distort the domestic economy by pricing their goods and services below market rates and this undermines legitimate businesses. Revelations in the international media, Mr. Speaker, revelations of a Guyana-Italy cocaine conspiracy are ominous. Evidence that Guyanese narco-traffickers are working hand in hand with Italian mafiosi linked to the Gambino and Bonanno families and the Italian crime syndicates confirm fears that Guyana is sleepwalking into narco statehood. Some people diligently collect newspaper click clippings of 20 years ago, but they cannot remember what happened two months ago. As old people say, Mr. Speaker, Jackass is long. But you know, I hear your own story. Yeah. Guyana's hinterland, west of Fort Island and the Esquibo River, is a dangerous place. Banditry is rampant. Contraband smuggling is an everyday occurrence. Disease is prevalent. Poverty is pervasive. Educational standards, particularly in those regions, one, seven, eight, and nine, are lower than the rest of the country. The hinterland comprises over three quarters of this country's territory. It has long unwatched borders with Brazil, Venezuela, and Suriname, vast unpatrolled open spaces, unmonitored airstrips, and numberless rivers and creeks, creeks which have become corridors and channels for illegal narcotics and firearms to be brought into the country. The truth is, 
Our nation wakes up every morning to the dreary reality of shoddy road repairs, broken schools, and underfunded university, shaky institutions, and a brigade of jobless dropouts. The problem, of course, is that this budget simply does not provide the funds to confront the most serious challenges facing our families. Yeah. And those challenges are the unavailability of jobs for young school leavers, yeah. the poor quality of education at primary and secondary levels yeah. in both the coastland and hinterland, the daily threats to human safety where there is an armed robbery every eight hours, there are two murders every week and 12 fatal accidents every month. Wow. The threats of disease, of dengue, of gastroenteritis, of malaria. Why? Because we have the same old PPP with the same old prejudices. Wow. The minority administration must not presume that it could ignore the majority will that it could ignore what the majority of people want and desire in this country. The minority administration cannot attempt to exclude the majority side from contributing to the budget preparation. The minority, minority administration must collaborate with the majority so that together we can be co-workers in creating a budget which affects the future of all of the people of this country. The view from Main Street is limited. Yes. It is difficult to comprehend fully the complexity of the demographic, economic, social, and political changes taking place throughout the country. All politics is local. Yes. And we are on the ground among the people, listening to the ordinary people, learning from the ordinary people. So, Mr. Speaker, when we speak, we speak with the voice of the people. And that is why we want to be heard, we want to be listened to. The budget, despite its promise, a better Guyana for all Guyanese, is, as I said before, degenerating into a bitter Guyana for, bitter Guyana for most Guyanese. But more seriously, Mr. Speaker, this budget is dangerously dividing Guyana into two nations. Yes. It is creating an east-west divide that separates everything west of the Essequibo from everything that lies to the east. Let the budget analyze the average per capita income of residents west of the Essequibo. Let the budget analyze the allocation of finance for roads west of the Essequibo. Let the budget calculate the standard of living of the largest concentration of poor people in this country, That's right. west of the Essequibo. Look at the budget speech, for example, Mr. Speaker. Look at the section entitled Physical Infrastructure for Transportation, pages 32 to 33. Where are the roads that are going to be built? East Bank, Demerara. West Coast, Demerara. East Coast, Demerara. They are not in the rich gold-bearing and timber-bearing industry um, areas. This budget, Mr. Speaker, perpetuates a dangerous divergence. It perpetuates disparities and divisions which have hindered the development of the larger part of this country. Is this deliberate or is it an acute case of Main Street myopia? The hinterland on the development crisis has been ably articulated by our MPs, Sidney Alicock, Don Hastings, Valerie Lowe, Eula Marcello, George Norton, and Renito Williams. And no one knows the interior better than they do in this house. But they know that hinterland on the development will not correct itself. There must be budgetary intervention. The Pitaro Seperuni region, the Barimo Waini, and the Kuyuni Mazaruni, and the Rupununi regions might be the biggest parts of the country, but they're also the poorest. But what do we have 
we have the same old PVP with the same old light pass for the hinterland. <laughs> the hinterland communities do not need baubles and beads. They don't need toys and trinkets. Handouts more the human initiative. Any of the residents will tell you that. Handouts extinguish local enterprise. The hinterland, like everywhere else, needs reliable services. It needs community-based solar, wind, and electricity generation projects to give them water supply. Look at what is happening at this Chung River. That is a charade, if I ever saw one. The Chung, the Chung Falls. Beautiful photographs. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? Probably in your lifetime, there'll be no hydro project on the Chung River. Just like a mile. Because there is no road to get the turbines to the Chung River. They will plan all they want, but there's no road to get the turbines in. So the first thing is that they have the great photographs and then discover that there's no road to move the turbines in. Mr. Speaker, the hinterland, the hinterland looks like a diseased animal with mined out parts of degenerated into a mosquito infested wasteland. Our evergreen forests and pristine waterways are under threat. Our people are poor, exploiting the economic resources and sustaining the livelihood of residents and protecting the environment demand a new approach to hinterland administration. The national budget must provide for regional administrative centers. Bartica, one of the oldest communities in this country, over 150 years old, Maria, Mabaruma, and Letham, all administrative centers for those important regions, one, seven, eight, and nine, must be quickly upgraded to township status with their own mayors, with their own mayors and town councils. We must stop treating the hinterland as bush. The hinterlands mining and logging tourism, Mr. I didn't interrupt you. you know, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I really didn't interrupt you. I was tempted, you know, but you know, I gave you a break. The hinterland mining, logging, and tourism resources have been exploited for over a century, and they continue to enrich the national treasury. But their physical infrastructure is inadequate for such a vast territory. Its small, scattered population is vulnerable to criminal violence, to human trafficking, and to environmental hazard. Guyana's economic development has been impeded. Its international competitiveness has been impaired because of the lack of major investment in public infrastructure collapsing sellings, an aging fleet of ferries, deteriorating hinterland airstrips, broken bridges, impassable roadways, weakened caucus and sea defenses have all become major obstacles to everyday commuting, communication, and commerce. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because we have the same old PPP and the same old presumptuousness. Budget 14 has done nothing to inspire hope. A bold budget was needed to move the country forward at a faster pace, but such a budget is yet to be seen. Yeah. Every budget is a plan, an economic plan, a financial plan, a plan that must be forward, not backward looking, if it's to be of any value. It must have a clear vision. It must have a sense of mission. It must be a projection of what needs to be done tomorrow to solve today's problems. And the resources 
must be allocated to achieve these objectives. It is not a recapitulation of the previous administrations. It is to be a prospect of what will take place in future. The budget is meant to point the economy in the direction of transformation, to marshal the people's efforts, and to draw, to draw on their entrepreneurial energy to overcome the challenges together. Mr. Speaker, this budget did throw a few crumbs to school children and pensioners. But those amongst are crummy. Those amongst may please some of the people some of the time. But it could have done a lot more to address other constituencies, especially the youth and the students. and most particularly the workers. Our partnership deliberately designated the year 2014 as the year for workers. The underlying hope was that the authors of this budget would have understood the meaning for that designation and would have taken reasonable and realistic measures to encourage job creation for our potential workforce. But this budget continues to neglect our young workers. It, it neglects the provision of employment opportunity and enterprise. The PPP spends like a drunken sailor on a lot of little projects. The President Youth Choice Initiative, you don't even hear about it anymore. The President Youth Award, Republic of Guyana. The Youth Enterprise and Apprenticeship Scheme, just come on board last year, the National Training Program for Youth Empowerment. But what is the value of all of these schemes? Who measures the impact of these schemes on the lives of young people, on their careers and their jobs of the persons who graduate from them? These schemes are good at sharing out a lot of red polo shirts, but in fact, they are just versions of PPP pet projects. What young people want, and what they have told us they want, are permanent institutions, not ad hoc programs. Yes. They told us that they want regional technical institutes. Every region yes. must have a technical institute. Every region must have an agricultural institute. Every one of those regions, particularly one seven eight and nine, is an agricultural region. And people make their living from farming. And they want to have these institutes, not just on the coastland, but also in the hinterland, in the regions where they live. They told us they want regional swimming and sports centers, so that young people. They told us that they want regional agricultural development banks. They don't want to be treated as Bush. They want to be treated as part of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. So, Mr. Speaker, the budget must include real measures that provide work for young people wherever they are, all over Guyana. The basic fact is that all parties acknowledge that Budget 2014 is not capable of bringing about change for the mass of young people. The fact is, jobs are scarce. Young school leavers simply do not have the skills to equip many of them for the world of work in Guyana. They migrate to Brazil, where people, secondary school graduates, work as farmhands or work in restaurants because there's no work here in Guyana. The economy simply is not providing jobs for the employment of those young people. Mr. Speaker, the story of the NIS is another dream that has gone sour. As we know, the NIS began its operation 45 years ago under the People's National Congress administration. 
Prime Minister Forbes Burnham had a clear vision of a welfare state that stood on three pillars. One was free education from university, from nursery to university. The other was affordable housing. And the third pillar was social protection through the creation of a national insurance scheme. That scheme was designed to provide coverage from the cradle to the grave. And we expect, Mr. Speaker, that concrete measures would ensure that the social protection that was promised through the NIS is guaranteed. But what have we got? The same old PPP, the same old culture. The government of Guyana needs to introduce a serious mm, check also up. Uh, the government of Guyana needs to introduce a serious security strategy to protect our citizens from criminal violence. APNU accuses the PPP of failing to implement the types of reforms that could strengthen border and hinterland security. <clears throat> APNU accuses the PPP in this budget debate of deliberately avoiding references to the high rate of armed robberies, yes. the high rate of contraband smuggling, yes. the rate of gun running, the rate of money laundering, the rate of narco trafficking, the rate of people trafficking, the rate of piracy, the rate of banditry. These are the crimes that are sucking the oxygen out of the economy. These are the crimes that are stifling the manufacturing sector that are strangling local enterprise. In the meantime, the PPP is infatuated with community policing and secu citizen security, neighborhood police, but that infatuation is misplaced. We still experience, Mr. Speaker, the shockwaves of criminal violence which plagued the first decade of this millennium during the presidency of Mr. Jagdeel. This period will be remembered in this country's history for its extraordinary number of drug-driven murders, for massacres, and for executions. Yet, these crimes remain uninvestigated, and yet many of the criminals remain unpunished. Oh. Guyana is bleeding. The PPP administration has failed to enforce laws mm -hmm. which protect lives mm -hmm. and which ensure that the killings are investigated. This budget 2014 has failed to promise new measures which could strengthen the police to enable it to prevent the recurrences of those atrocities. The budget must show us, Mr. Speaker, how the provision of financial resources will make our country safe by curbing the cocaine trade, by curbing gun running, by curbing the crimes which are pumping violence, violence into this country. But what we have in the budget is the same old PPP, same old PPP. the same old stinginess, This country, Mr. Speaker, has never been wealthy, but the proliferation of hordes of extremely poor, destitute, and homeless persons of street children over the last two decades yeah. is a man-made catastrophe. We are not in a post-war situation. Poverty is not an act of God. Poverty is not force majeure. It's a man-made problem. A problem that could be solved with good governance and sensible public policies. Yes, yes. There are too many poor people, people who cannot afford to purchase even a low cost diet every day. That is why, Mr. Speaker, APNU has put so much emphasis on the human condition in our budget debate. Even at this late stage, 
the PPP administration can still amend its own budget by reducing the value added tax. The 10%. By reducing income tax and by generating and guaranteeing jobs for school leavers. Well, our colleague Cameron just told you where to get the money from. The one secret accounts have now been brought to light. The budget did not even mention Guyana's poverty reduction strategy paper, not even as a footnote. This poverty reduction strategy paper was meant to be a mechanism by which Guyana could eliminate poverty. But what we see in this budget is that the poor have been abandoned. The PPP budget 2014 will be measured by its impact on poor people, its impact on the nation. Yeah. APNU reserves its right to disagree with its provisions, those provisions which we do not see to be in the national interest. There's no way that the country can move forward with such a budget, one that continues to disregard the needs of the most important factor in national development, the ordinary people. We have here, Mr. Speaker, the same old PPP, but the time is up. Moon or until sun catch em. Yes. There is still time for Guyana to move forward. The National Assembly has an obligation to provide the leadership that is needed to produce a better budget. We have a duty now as we enter the Committee of Supply to design plans and strategies to make changes so that we could overcome the economic and, and social challenges in order to provide the quality of life to our people. We must use the next stage of this budget process to forestall any folly that might prolong the nightmare of poverty yeah. that could lead us down the path of destitution. Mr. Speaker, a partnership for national unity <coughs> signals tonight that it disagrees with certain measures which have been proposed. And when you put those questions as put you must, we shall exercise our constitutional right. That's right. express our agreement or disagreement. We might have we might have the same old PPP, but we also have a new AP and new AFC dispensation. And if the old PPP won't do it, the new partners together must move to save this budget from itself. We must work towards giving our people a better life yeah. and not the better life that the present budget promises. I thank you, Mrs. Speaker.